all participants, since this is a virtual event to respect the privacy, story, experiences, and confidentiality of all others. Everyone at this event is here in this time of chaos, to say the least, in the midst of a global pandemic. And we need to let what all people share, share or and engage at their own pace. Thank you. Now on to the next slide. Before we go any further, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. Before we begin today's festivities, we wanted to recognize the land acknowledgement because native land was taken by force and colonized to form the United States as we know today. Through this process, which is an ongoing through systematic oppression, native identity, history, and land ownership has been ignored by colonizers and attempted to be erased. A land acknowledgement is a formal statement that recognizes and respects indigenous people as traditional stewards of this land and the enduring relationships that exist between indigenous people and their traditional territories. Land acknowledgement is the first step in opposing the system systematic impression, I'm sorry, oppression and historic erasure of native people and native land ownership. Next slide, please. We acknowledge that this gathering is taking place through the traditional territories of the Coastal Salish and other allied band signatory to the 1855 Treaty of Point Elliot, including the Snohomish, Duwamish, Tuwalup, Suquamish, Stillaguamish, Nisqually, Puyallup, Coastal Salish, and Muckleshoot tribes. We recognize the stewardship of Washington's green spaces by the Coast Salish people since time immemorial. The disruption of this work by colonization and now endeavor to continue this work. We make this acknowledgement to remind ourselves that by being here today, we strive to remedy this injustice through our beliefs and actions in helping to steward our green spaces and communities in Washington. Next slide, please. What you can expect from this glorious week. This is going to be exciting. Thank you for that space and time. This week is full of great information and cool, cool, super cool prizes. Tomorrow we are having an exciting lineup of students just like you pursuing careers in healthcare, who will talk about their journey and experience in school. We also have an amazing panel of healthcare practitioners in a variety of different occupations, and they are set up to talk to you about their real life experiences. That's tomorrow. Day three is our occupation exploration day, full of amazing presenters and different healthcare occupations who have designed presentations about their journey in medicine, hardships to overcome, successes, and what it's like to work in their particular field. Day four is your time to explore the local education options. Inspired by healthcare panelists or one of the presentations you've heard, check out what it takes to get there from our local education partners. Finally, on day five, you'll get to hear about ways to chart your healthcare path and attend the college fair. Next slide. Now we get on to the really cool stuff. Prizes, 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 prizes. Great, let's talk about them. Now you have three opportunities to win some amazing prizes each, prizes each day. Each day we are raffling away three $50 gift cards and everyone who completes the contest has a chance to win. You will see the, whatever that sign is, looks like a tic-tac-toe symbol, added to the contest, hashtag I think it is, sorry, added to the contest where you can win. There will be two winners for each contest and one winner for the action. And at the end of the week on Friday, we will raffle off two $500 and one $250 gift card to those who have attended, completed the end of day survey and engaged each day, each day this week. All raffle participants will be entered into a randomizer 
and winners will be selected. So come back every day this week and learn a lot. All opportunities to be entered into raffles will come through different Google forms placed in the chat each day of the event. Please remember to only send completed work. Finally, on day five, there is yet another chance for you to win $50. Three $50 gift cards will be given out to three random attendees of the college fair on day five from 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. We hope to see you there. Next slide, please. Action of the day. For the action today, check out the Google Doc link provided each day in the chat box. Again, each day there will be a different Google Doc to use and complete. This is due by 10 p.m. tonight, and winners will be announced tomorrow at 3 p.m. Stay tuned after our presenters today for the contest of the day. And another chance to win $50, a $50 gift card. Poll of the day. Before we dive in to the, our amazing presenters and their stories, we wanted to poll you all with a level, well, with a level setting questions or a level setting of questions. We have one question as our warm up. Please pull out your phones. Yes, those cell phones. We know you've got them. That's right. Now you get to text. <laughs> text workforce DEV 926. Don't worry about the capital letters to number 22333 and let us know which high school or program you are here representing. Let us know if you are in Tumwater, Mount Tahoma, from the Boys and Girls Club, Stadium, Rainier Beach, etc. After about a minute, I hope everybody's doing it. Text, 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 text. How are we doing? Okay, very good job. Now, for the real question we want you to mull over. Next slide, if you're ready. Still getting those names of those places. We'll wait. I think some people might be having some issues, but I hope they're getting worked out. Okay, and three to four words describe why you are interested in healthcare as a career, are you excited to serve your community? Is the money appealing? Do you really want to help sick kids? Do you have an experience as a child that called you to help other people heal? This is a, uh, an industry where you can really make a significant difference in the lives of people. You know, physical health, mental health, there's so many different avenues that you can go down in uh, a healthcare field. So it's some, this is an opportunity to really think about um, what you like to do, what's the most meaningful to you. That's why it's so valuable that the, you talk to the speakers, you listen to them, because I think what will happen is there will be a chord that will be struck in you that really will help you move in a certain direction. Thanks for your input. This is great input. And whenever the person is ready to move the slide, we can do that. And then I will introduce our first speaker. We'll wait a little while, a few more. My dad is forcing me. Well, my parents forced me to do some things. So, and I'm happy that they did. <laughs> forced me to stay in college. Helping others, helping people, making a difference. These are all great. Okay, well, as these keep coming in, I think in the interest of time, 
I'm going to move into introducing our speaker. And I will have uh, some more of these comments coming in as I, I do a little intro to Dr. Julian Perez. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Julian Perez. He graduated from the University of Idaho with an undergraduate bachelor's in zoology and a minor in Spanish. He went to medical school at University of Washington School of Medicine and continued his education through a sports medicine fellowship at Swedish Medical Center at Cherry Hill. He is currently a family physician at CMAR Community Health Centers, a social determinants of health committee physician champion and serves on COVID on the COVID clinical task force for recommendations to the chief medical officer. You can hear him provide daily COVID radio updates on El Rey, the big 1360 AM. While an MD, Dr. Perez knows the importance of all of the occupations in the healthcare field. We are honored to have you, Dr. Perez. Whenever you're ready, we still have some. I am ready. You are ready. OK, take okay. it away, Dr. Perez. Great. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, can you guys all hear me? Can someone give me a nod if you can hear me? Great, all right. Well, uh, thanks all of you for showing up to this. Um, life's about showing up and we know that uh, based on good times and tough times. We're in tough times, right? So it's all about showing up. And I, what I wanna do is I wanna take you guys through a typical day of mine and let you know how many people that I interact with in order to make a difference in people's lives. Cause a lot of you guys wanna help. You wanna make a difference in people's lives. And you can't do it alone. We do this in a team now. Medicine has changed. And uh, I rely on a lot of friends and teammates for this. So um, basically last night I was on call, okay? I got called around 9 p.m. And there was a resident doctor. That's a doctor that's training to be a doctor, full-fledged full doctor like I am now. And she said, you have a patient in labor. Her water broke and she needs to um, come in and have her baby. And so I went to the hospital. And when I got there, I went into the triage room where she was um staying and i met the nurse and so this nurse um is an rn they have bachelor degrees that's a four-year degree to become a nurse and they go through a lot of different rotations uh and decide what area of nursing they want to work in and so labor and delivery is that part of the hospital where all the pregnant women come have their babies and then the nurses uh take care of them through that whole process and and, and as well as postpartum which is a day or two in the hospital before they go back home they also take care of the newborns uh, so these are wonderful nurses. They're very smart. They're very bright. They're very um, forward with their opinions and tell you exactly what they think needs to be done, which is why I love working with them. So I go see the patient and decide that she's going to need an ultrasound. And so I send her downstairs to the ultrasound room. And uh, there she meets an ultrasound technician who is another uh, medical professional that goes to school for about two years. And in that two years, they learn all about the physics of ultrasound. They learn how to use all kinds of different ultrasound machines, and they learn how to do ultrasounds at different parts of the body, including the abdomen, the heart, the lungs, um, the, the, the vessels, the nerves, the brain, uh, the neck. Uh, very, very interesting stuff and a rapidly advancing field. Um, people in this uh, area with these um, technician types of jobs, they also do CAT scans, they do MRIs, they work in um, ophthalmology clinics, for example, and get all of your eye stuff ready before the ophthalmologist surgeon comes to see you. They make enough to pay rent and live fairly comfortably in Seattle. And I, want, I just wanna kind of put it there for you because some of you guys are talking about like, what's the money and am I gonna be able to live on one job? I don't wanna have to do three jobs like my mom and dad. That is really common among our patients. And so I totally, um, I totally get that. But um, pretty decent jobs in this tech field. So after she gets back from the ultrasound, she comes upstairs. And we say, yep, it's time to come in. And so we admit her and um, she uh, goes into labor and has her baby. Um, when the baby's born, sometimes we have complications. And if a baby needs to be uh, rescued, like that's having trouble breathing, well, I got two patients, right? I got a mom that's bleeding um, and possibly having, um, I have to get that placenta out. And then I have a newborn baby that's having trouble too. It's hard to be in two places at once, right? And so that's why we work in a team. We may call a second pair of hands, which is another nurse from the uh, neonatal intensive care unit. 
And those are nurses that have gone to school for a little bit longer to do a specialty area. And they come down and they're really confident, really smooth, really calm, save the day, help the baby start breathing again, even give a little mask oxygen, maybe have to intubate that baby. Um, and then if necessary, take the baby upstairs to give it a higher level of care. Uh, these nurses uh, usually are four degree, uh, four year degree nurses and, and then do a couple um, uh, extra rotations or maybe another year of specialty in order to do that. So then I go, um, calls over, right? I slept in the hospital and I have to zip on over to the clinic to see my patients, okay? So this is the difference between the inpatient world, which is the hospital, and the outpatient world, which is the clinic, okay? And, and I'm a family doctor, and so I see people from ages two days old, right out of the hospital, all the way to 102 years old, and they're, they're ready to keel over, all right? Everybody in between, all problems, all um, levels of health as well, and we really get excited to help people be healthy and live healthy. And so I, I see about, you know, 20 to 21 patients a day. And in those visits, uh, we may be doing vaccinations for kids. We're doing a lot of vaccinations for adults now against COVID. And I work with a huge team of people there, okay? So I walk in the clinic and I see my um, receptionists. Actually, the first person I meet is the person that's screening me for, for a fever and asking me all the questions to make sure I don't have COVID so I'm safe to work. Those can be volunteers. They also can be anybody in the clinic we pull to help us with that. Then once I screen negative, I come in and I talk to the receptionist and I check my schedule for the day. Receptionists, you know, they're paid a decent uh, wage as well. They are union staff, meaning that um, they undergo a collective bargaining agreement that some representatives help them out with or that they participate um, directly in that, um, uh, in, that, uh, in that bargaining process. And so that helps them to maintain good wages and to make sure that they have good benefits, okay? And so that's another thing to think about in the healthcare field. Um, there are uh, salaried staff, meaning like I'm a doctor, I get a salary. If I work, maybe if I saw 10 patients a day or if I saw 30 patients, I get paid the same, okay? Because that's just the job. Whatever comes in the door is what I'm responsible for. Um, but then you have people who will work by the hour and they may be, uh, they may be um, hourly wages and or union. And so union wages usually get a little higher wages usually have decent benefits and there's always um, built-in breaks and, and protections to make sure that you have a good quality job. And then if you have any issues with what's going on, you have a grievance process. And so it helps to protect the employees. And so that's something else to think about, whether you wanna be part of like a collective, like a union, or you wanna be part of a private clinic where um, you may not have that protection, but perhaps you have a little more flexibility uh, in other areas of your job. And so, um, my receptionist goes through the day with me and I make sure that he or she has all the forms that I need to prepare for that day and make sure that they know about any patients that I saw in the hospital that need to be seen today or maybe tomorrow. That uh, seems like, well, that's just the receptionist, right, Dr. Prez? We literally cannot do it without those folks. They work so hard. They know all of our patients by first name. They know their family members. They know all the emergencies that are going on in their home and they really help to bind together all of the efforts that we make in order to keep people healthy. Because if we cannot coordinate people getting into the clinic and give them the right kind of visits at the right time and give me enough time to see them, it's just chaos. And so it's really important that we have those front desk staff that are excellent at the jobs and really have good customer service skills and really good with people. Um, so after I talk with my receptionist, I go in and talk to my medical assistant. And my medical assistant is a, uh, um, uh, uh, she has gone to school for a year in order to take vital signs, to give shots. But depending on where you work as a medical assistant, they can do EKGs, they can draw blood, they can shoot x-rays. Uh, my my uh, uh, assistant also helps me with procedures like colposcopy, which is when women have an abnormal pap smear and we have to see if they have cancer. Uh, we do ultrasound guided um, procedures. They help, um, they help me set up the ultrasound machine before I do an ultrasound, if I'm gonna do any kind of diagnostics or injections. And so this, it's a tremendously flexible um, area. Uh, they are also union um, uh, staff, which means that they have pretty decent wages for, for one year uh, only of, of, of study. And again, I think we can't give them enough credit. They run the clinic. If it wasn't for our medical assistants, like we would be hopeless and helpless. They really run the clinic. And so we thank them every day that they're there. And there's multiple levels of uh, medical assistance. You can go into uh, supervision, you can be trainer, um, and then you can go all the way up into like, you're kind of running a clinic, you know, and, and do other things like uh, um, OB coordination, which is prenatal care, uh, coordinating those women. 
So once I get um, now to my office and I start to see patients, then typically my um, team consists of me, my medical assistant, and usually a care coordinator. So a care coordinator is a relatively new position as well in healthcare. We get a lot of folks applying for uh, jobs with us in this area uh, for several reasons. Number one, we serve a very diverse group of people. We need to have um, multiple languages spoken among our staff. And in doing so, we also really, really value people that come from um, diverse backgrounds. So let's say, you know, I might see 40 different um, languages within our clinic, maybe not in the same day, but, you know, 40, 40 different uh, countries represented among our patients. So that's a lot of cultural um, diversity and different, different cultures have different views of what health and illness are. And that's why we have so many people that are kind of scratching their head thinking like, do I want that COVID shot? Like, I don't do this in my country. We just get sick and deal with it. So all of those types of cultural uh, considerations is what my care coordinator helps me out with. They also make sure that if I refer somebody for a test that we don't do in our clinic, that they can help the patient navigate on how to get there. They might help them with transportation. They might help them with um, uh, uh, assistance to get food. And right now a big one is all of our patients who are from other countries that don't qualify for federal assistance for the COVID emergency. Now the state of Washington has a fund. And so they will talk to those patients and make sure they fill out the paperwork and they can get some money to help them pay the rent. And if you can help somebody pay the rent, you are saving a life for sure. And I totally appreciate that because on our committee, when we talk about social determinants of health, me giving you a pill, like they pay me a whole lot of money to be a doctor. I push a lot of pills, guys. I push a lot of pills. I do a lot of injections, but those aren't necessarily what makes you healthy. The things that make you healthy are, did you get enough sleep last night? Can you pay the bills with one job? Um, can you fulfill your dream of having a family? Are you gonna be able to fulfill the American dream of getting an education and buying a home? Are you gonna be able to um, afford the gas to put in your car so you can get to your third job? I mean, these types of things matter a ton. And we could not take care of people if we didn't have folks that were doing care coordination, especially health education, making sure that they have the time to talk with people about what makes them healthy and what makes them sick. And so um, the, that's, that's the three keys with me. It's a doctor, a medical assistant, and a care coordinator. And then outside of that, I have a lot of people within the same clinic that I can uh, tap on the shoulder and ask them, hey, can you give me some hand for this patient? A health educator. Let's say that a patient comes in and they have a new diagnosis of diabetes, which is when your sugar's too high. And they may know nothing about this. All they know is my mom had it and I know she had to inject insulin. That's all I know. So what we do is we say, okay, come over and meet with a health educator. We can do that in person, on the phone, or by Zoom like this. And so we meet the patient where they're at technologically. If we need interpreters, we get the interpreters. And let me tell you something, interpreters make 50 bucks an hour. They are worth their weight in gold. We could not do it without interpreters because we have people from 40 different countries in our clinic, right? So that's another excellent field. And if you already speak the language, you basically just have to take maybe three or six months of classes, pass a test, and you're in. So let's say we go talk to the health educator and the health educator is uh, somebody, typically they've finished college and they've uh, applied for the job and maybe their undergraduate degree was in maybe health education or public health or um, pre-med studies, things like this. And a lot of people will actually take these types of jobs where they are assisting the physicians in the community health center uh, setting so that they get experience in order to apply to medical school. So I want you guys to remember that too, because a lot of you have dreams to be doctors um, part of the reason of this talk is to make sure that you know all of the different positions that you can be in and what it takes to get there. And then also consider those positions on your way, like on your path to, to getting where you eventually want to be. So um, my health educator is incredibly uh, helpful, very talented, and she has this secret Jedi mind trick that, she, that we call motivational interviewing, okay? And motivational interviewing is a way that you can talk with people to get them talking and to kind of help them solve their own problems. And so an example of that would be somebody saying, um, you know, I don't know if I want to have that vaccine. And you would, instead of saying, no, you have to get the vaccine. It's so important because you could die. That's not, that's not going to help a lot of folks that are in that mindset. And so you might say something like, hmm, tell me more about that. And then you just, you just zip your lip and let them talk. Okay. I'm really bad at this. I'm really bad at this, which is why I need people to help me with this, right? We need to help people get all those thoughts out and to help them get to a decision that is right for them, but it's also right for the public health. And so I send a lot of people to the health educator to help me with that. So if you like spending time with people and talking like about details and really helping them get that out, all those types of counseling positions, health education, our nutritionists as well, 
She has a bachelor's degree in nutrition. She did an internship, which is a one-year training in, in nutrition. And now she has a job that gives her a pretty decent salary, like 45,000 a year. So there again is one um, position where if she's working, you know, and, and has a partner that's working as well, you know, they're going to be able to afford to possibly buy a small home in Seattle. And so that's a really nice setup for just five, four years plus one. Okay. Four years plus one. Anyway, she gets an hour with her patients as well. And she does a lot of this type of Jedi motivational interviewing to really help people get there, right? To, to, to take that healthy diet, to eat right, to find out how they're going to fit some exercise into their day. All those things that I would love to spend that time with a patient. Um, unfortunately, I get 15 minutes of visit, you know, and what I'm able to offer that patient in 15 minutes, that is where the art of medicine comes in. That's where you're really needing to listen carefully and offer just that one piece of advice and then pills, pills, prescriptions, right? Referrals, tests, boom, next patient. Ah, some days. Anyway, so we talked about health education, nutrition. We also have a bridge to the mental health world. And that is really important because people, you cannot separate the head from the body, right? Um, and we tend to try and do this in medicine. I'm an internal medicine doctor. I, I cover from the neck to the pelvis. That's all I do, right? And then someone's like, I'm a cardiologist. I, 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 I take care of this. That's all I do. I'm a family doctor. I got to take care of it all, right? So because we take care of it all, because we see everybody that walks through the door, we need help. And so we have this really wonderful position. Her name, uh, her, her, her job is called an integrated mental health therapist. And that is a counselor that is embedded in our clinic. Mental health and depression and anxiety and stress, it is at record levels right now. Many, many people, um, including some of you possibly, are going through very difficult times, frustrated that you're looking at a screen. You may have thought very, very dark um, thoughts that you don't want to talk about to anybody because you're like, just shocked that those came into your head. Those are exactly the reasons that we have this particular staff member with us. Because when I talk with people and they open up about these things, they need time, right? They need to talk about it. And time is something that I don't have a lot of. And so I need to say, you know what? I got somebody perfect for you to talk with. I want you to unload on this person. And I'm gonna come back and see you in about 45 minutes. And we're gonna make sure that you're safe and that you don't need a little extra help in order to be safe in the form of possibly medication or possibly an admission to the hospital. And so that person comes in and works her magic. She just gives that patient the opportunity to dump everything out. And then she helps them organize it a bit and come up with a plan. And then she helps me figure out, is that patient in a lot of trouble? Do they need to be in the hospital? Or no, Dr. Perez, they're gonna be just fine. Let's see them. I'll work with this patient you know, a few times and I'll have them come back and see you after three or four sessions. So that is an invaluable position. And mental health and counseling, a lot, you know, a lot of you really want to go into this because I read that you want to help people. You love to get to know people. You know, those human relationships, it's all about our human relationships in life. People told me that, you know, when I was in your seat and I was like, yeah, but I thought it was about the parties. You know, <laughs> yeah, things change as you get older and as you get more experience and as you go through life. Um, you know, we're going to hear from Jerry Garcia, Dr. Garcia today. He's going to tell us about his, some of his experiences and what he's learned from those. And I want you to listen very carefully to him. So um, we are, um, I've got two minutes left before I take questions. And so basically the point is that in a day, I, I rely on a lot of people to take care of folks. And, and I'll just use these last two minutes to tell you uh, what it takes to become a doctor. And so I was in high school. I went to college for four years. I took a couple of years off to travel and see the world and make sure that, you know, I kind of figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And then I went to medical school. I went to the WAMI program. Uh, medical school is four more years. So that's four plus four, it's eight years. And then once you finish medical school, provided you don't expand or do something um, for whatever reason, then you need to do a residency training program. If you do primary care, it's only three years. Pediatrics is three years. Uh, general surgery, five years. Um, and so those are the primary care specialties. Um, and then if you wanna do a specialty like cardiology, you first have to do internal medicine, which is three years. So you already did four college, four medical school, three of internal medicine, there's the fingers. And then you wanna do cardiology, guess what? Three more years of cardiology, okay? So you can give EKGs and echocardiograms and prescribe medication for hearts. It is a ton of time. And so think about that. Think about how much time you have, how much time you wanna spend. And the last thing I'll say is that when I was coming up in high school, there was a lot more assistance to go to college. College wasn't nearly as expensive. I had Pell Grants. I went to University of Idaho that was relatively um, affordable. 
And now, like, it's so scary <laughs> how much it costs to go to college. I'm already saving for my little girl to go to college because I don't want to go broke paying for it. So there's all these things that you're going to hear about this week on how to prepare for what you want to do. If you've got a dream and you really want to make it happen, I encourage you to pursue it. Pursue it and make it happen, all right? But if you are interested in healthcare and you're not exactly sure what you want to do with, with that interest, this is the week for you, okay? This is where you figure it out. So I'm going to take some questions now. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Perez, and, and thank you for uh, such a candid and informative uh, presentation. We are going to take some questions in the chat, so please, in the next uh, two, two or three minutes, put your questions in the chat. But I do have one right off the bat that I would like you to respond to. And what is the importance of people of color in the healthcare industry, especially in view of our growing diversity in this country? Yeah, yeah, indispensable, guys. We we couldn't take care of our populations of uh, uh, communities of color without physicians of color, without nurses of color, without technicians of color, without staff of color, without bilingual support staff. I mean, that's what CMAR, where I work, is all about. We were founded to take care of migrant workers, and most of them at the time were Mexican migrant workers. If they couldn't, they, most of them didn't speak English, and so you had to speak Spanish to, to, to take care of them. Interpreters, that was not an invented specialty back then. Uh, and now we have people from 40 different uh, uh, countries sometimes 50 different countries, depending on the clinic we're in. So absolutely indispensable. We need more people of color in the healthcare field. It is a growing field. The country is aging. We've got an awful lot of um, you know, new challenges we're, we're, we're seeing like COVID-19 and um, absolutely indispensable. Okay. Great question. We had another question about, um, the question is, what if I wanna be an OBGYN, how long would I have to go to school for? That okay. particular field. Yeah, good. OBGYN, that is a surgical subspecialty. You do four years of college, four years of medical school, and I believe they do four years of residency. And so each year you do more and more surgery and more and more clinic. Um, when you're done, you can do C-sections on your own. You can operate on any kind of a female surgical problem, like taking out the uterus or tying the tubes or dealing with cancer. If you want to do an extra fellowship in oncology, which is the specialty that takes care of cancer, that's called on, uh, gynonc or gynecological oncology. That's another about three years to four years. And so you can put a lot of time in. Um, also, OBGYNs can do something called maternal fetal medicine, which is a specialty in high risk pregnancies. And so take, for example, if a woman was to be diagnosed with type one diabetes, um, and then she got pregnant, that's a pretty complicated patient. There's a lot of risk to that baby. And so we rely on the smartest doctors in the hospital. I will tell you, Maternal fetal medicine doctors are the smartest doctors in the hospital, for sure. All right, we have a double question here. How much did you pay for medical school? Was it tough? Yeah. You're talking big bucks here? Okay, good, good question. So I applied to only four medical schools. I'm Mexican, my family don't make a lot of money. And so I went. I applied to Utah, University of Washington, uh, Stanford, which is hell expensive. And another one on the East Coast, I can't remember what it was called, hell expensive. Um, I got accepted to all four. I only got uh, enough scholarships to really make it doable at the state schools. I went to the UW because it's a whammy program. And what that means is um, Washington, Wyoming, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho. At the time, University of Washington was the only medical school for five states that covered about one fourth to one third of the entire territory of the United States of America. And so I went there and uh, as well, the cost was pretty low. So I paid in-state tuition, yes. I paid in-state tuition to go to medical school. And when I was all said and done, I owed $75,000, which sounds like a lot of money, but I, hey, my brother's a doctor. He's got $380,000 he needs to pay back and he's having a rough time with that. So think about that. Okay, last question before we- And it was hard. You. Oh, and it was hard. <laughs> last question before we- But I loved before. it. But you loved it, that's important. What did you wanna do before you decided to become a doctor? I wanted to go into the forest service and be a ranger out in the woods. Mm -hmm. I actually got my dream job to out in the woods and tag fish and live in the mountains of Idaho in a high mountain lake. And long story short, I didn't take it. Became a doctor. Okay. So <laughs> what was the turning point? What, what, I mean, was it a, like, like a light bulb went off in your head? I want to become a doctor or did something happen in your life? You know what? Uh, man, that's a fantastic question. Here's what happened. When I was in college, my dean actually said to me, because I needed to get into a class and they were all full. And I went to him and said, look, you want us to graduate in four years, right? Well, if I don't get into this class, I'm going to be here five years. You're going to see me for another year. He said, no, I don't want to see you anymore, Pettis. 
So he, he said, let me take a look at your grades. And he looked at my grades and he said, what do you do outside of school? And I told him I was in Mecha and I was dancing and I taught martial arts class and I was an athletic trainer in the, you know, for the football team. And he said, man, why don't you go to medical school? I said, medical school, what? He says, yeah, man, you got a 3.9 GPA. You got all these things you do, you volunteer. He says, I think you'd get in. Mm. And I never thought about that before. I did not have enough mentors that believed in me mm. and could recognize my skills and talents until that dean said that. And mm. that's what did it, guys. Well, and that's, a, you, you know, you raise such a good point is that sometimes it could be that person that steps into your life at a pivotal point that really helps steer you in a certain direction. So I'm glad you mentioned the mentorship. Fortunately, we have to move on. Thank you so much for taking right on. time. Uh, you're, you started this uh, whole week off with a bang, and we appreciate it. Make sure you guys show up for life. That's my advice. Show up for life. All right. Thank you so much. Now I need to turn it over to Laura Nichols and Dr. Jerry Garcia. Just a little bit about both of them. Laura Nichols is a licensed mental health therapist in the state of Washington and has been working in community mental health since 2014. She is also an adjunct professor at Lewis and Clark Graduate School in beautiful Portland, Oregon. She works for CMAR Community Health Center as a behavioral health program manager in Vancouver, Washington. She manages teams that serve high risk and high acuity individuals struggle with serious and persistent mental illness, as well as Clark County adult mobile crisis and co-responder unit that works in tandem with Clark County Crisis Services and the Vancouver Police Department. Laura is also the co-chair of CMAR's Diversity, Equity, and Anti-Racism Committee. Welcome. Dr. Jerry Garcia was raised in Quincy, Washington to parents who worked in agriculture most of their lives, and he is a proud migrant child. Dr. Garcia received his PhD in history from Washington State University. Prior to joining CMARS Community Health Centers, Dr. Garcia held academic appointments with Iowa State University, Michigan State University, Go Spartans, and was the director of the Chicano Education Program at Eastern Washington University. As Vice President of Educational Services, Dr. Garcia oversees the new CMAR Chicana and Latino Cultural and History Museum. Dr. Garcia also oversees as well as promotes and advocates for educational opportunities for the Chicano and Latino community through such programs as the Latino Educational Achievement Project, LEAP. Dr. Garcia's research focus is on Chicana history, Latin American and Mexican history, Asians in the Americas, immigration, empire, masculinity, and race in the Americas. He has authored five books and over 15 articles on his research interests. Please visit jerrygarcialives.com for more details on Dr. Garcia's research and general interests. Dr. Garcia was unlucky enough to contract the COVID-19 virus. He is going to share his story as a Latino and as a COVID patient. Jerry, we would love to hear your story. Take it away, Jerry. Thanks, Kevin. So I'm going to start us off. Um, good afternoon. Um, Dr. Garcia and I are so excited to be able to speak with you all today. Um, we actually are both first generation college students, and we know how overwhelming the college process um, can be. Um, I remember being 17 and going to college and thinking about how many more years of school I needed to do, um, but it was all completely worth it, and I'm glad I did it. Um, and so I can't even imagine doing all of that during a pandemic. So I'm so glad to be able to speak with you all today. Um, when you came in, you were asked that question about why healthcare, right? And there was um, a theme in there of um, helping people, right? And that's what I see a lot when I see people coming into um, the mental health field in particular. So I'm a mental health therapist primarily. Um, and I see that people really wanna come into this field to help people. Um, and they, they have a big heart and they wanna give that to other people. Um, and so if you go into healthcare, you will help people, you will impact their lives. And there's something so painful and yet so beautiful about caring for someone in some of their scariest and most intense moments of suffering. Um, and in those moments, the smallest acts of connection and care can make all the difference. So I'll tell you a story. 
Um, when I was 23 years old, I had made it through a year and a half of graduate school to be a counselor when my partner at the time was diagnosed with a rare blood cancer and they gave him a 50% chance of survival. Um, and there's one moment in that year of treatment that stands out to me um, where I felt seen and cared for even though I wasn't the one in the hospital bed. Um, it was just after he'd been diagnosed and he was super sick and foggy. Um, he was hardly present. Um, and I had spent the night on a chair um, that kind of pulled out into a bed in the intensive care unit. And the doctor had ordered some blood tests and two phlebotomists had already come in that morning to try to draw blood unsuccessfully, which meant he'd been stuck half a dozen times with a needle. And then the third phlebotomist came in um, a little while later and she was a middle-aged black woman. And my partner was, was disoriented and halfway asleep, um, but she tried to draw blood anyway, um, and she couldn't do it. And I started to cry just from feeling overwhelmed, from feeling powerless, alone, and scared. And she stood next to me. She put her hand on my shoulder and whispered, it's going to be okay. And that very quickly became my mantra. And she probably has no idea the impact she had on me, but that small moment of care and connection helped me find the courage to show up for all of the hard moments of that chapter of my life. He went through chemotherapy and is in remission now. I finished graduate school and started working as a mental health therapist, hoping to have that same kind of impact um, on the lives of others. But I quickly learned that even though I wanted to help people and went into a field to allow me to do that, there were systems my patients were intertwined with that created barriers to improving their lives in the, way they need, in the ways they needed them to change. Um, and I needed to help them overcome years of childhood trauma, racism, and systemic oppression. Unfortunately, discrimination exists in systems that are often meant to protect the well-being or health of others. Examples of systems like that are housing, education, criminal justice, finance, and even healthcare. Discrimination, which includes racism, often leads to chronic and toxic stress and increased pain increased experiences of trauma and mental health issues. So when you say you go into healthcare to help people, you have to also take into account the history of systemic oppression and generational trauma that our country has been built on. You have to know how you will actually be, actually be part of a large web of a system and how that system impacts yourself and the individuals you serve. So there are some ideas I want you to leave here today having a general understanding of those are health equity, anti-racism work, and trauma-informed care. I'm often asked how racism could possibly be connected to health equity and trauma-informed care. Health equity is about equal access to care, equal treatment in the care someone receives, and equitable outcomes. That means things like when you go to get treatment, you might get cared for by someone who looks like you. That means having procedures explained to you in your primary language even if English is not your primary language. Dr. Garcia is going to share with you a personal story that illustrates issues of inequity in our healthcare system. Thank you, Laura. Thank you for your sharing your story with us. Hello, everybody. Um, let me mention just a couple things uh, about myself before I move into my, to my story. Uh, you heard my, my introduction in regards to who I am. Uh, I come from a small rural community called Quincy, Washington in Eastern Washington. Um, 25 years later, it is still a small rural community. So not much has changed in my, in my hometown, but that's where I was born. That's when I was, where I was raised by parents who had immigrated from Mexico uh, to working agriculture here in the state of Washington. Uh, and so as, I, as the, uh, Kevin mentioned, I grew up as a migrant child, but I'll never forget that experience. And here's why. Because that's where I learned how to be a good worker from my parents. And what it, what, what, what it takes, the kind of drive you need uh, to succeed. And my, my father only had a third grade education. My mother only an eighth grade education, but they understood the importance of education and they didn't want to repeat the cycle of poverty in my family. And so they pushed education on, on all their children. And I was fortunate enough to break that cycle. Um, to go on to get um, the highest education you could possibly get in the United States. Um, I'm highly educated, got advanced degrees, um, and I owe it 
uh, to my experience uh, in a small rural farm farm community um, and my parents. And so uh, I was also in academia, I'm a, a professor uh, for 15 plus years. Um, and then I had an opportunity to come work for a community health center. And one of the things that I felt that was missing from my life um, as a professor working in these great schools throughout the country was a, a deeper kind of connection to, to my community to the Latinx Latino community. And so when I was offered the opportunity uh, to come to work at a place called Seamark Community Health Centers here in Western Washington, uh, I took that opportunity because I knew I was gonna be able to keep my foot in the door in regards to education, uh, but also uh, be in closer contact uh, with the BIPOC community here in Washington state. And so I've been with Seamark for about two and a half years and uh, of the 200 or so physicians they have in this organization. I, uh, I'm probably the only one that's not a medical doctor. I got a, I got a PhD in, in history. Um, and I've been very fortunate and that has opened a lot of doors for me. Of course, it opened one here at CMAR where I have one of the few physicians that doesn't deal with uh, directly, but it does indirectly deal with the healthcare system. Now, the main story I wanna tell you um, is being part of CMAR, I was very, very aware and very, very close to how the coronavirus, the COVID-19 has hit our community here in the state of Washington. Uh, being on the front lines with a health clinic allowed me to see that uh, up front and close. And um, I was able to protect myself very, very well until November, 2020, when I contracted the virus. Um, <clears throat> and um, because I was very familiar with the symptoms, I knew right away that I probably had COVID-19 on November 13th, 2020. And when I had the test taken, it was confirmed uh, that I, I tested positive. Uh, a few days later, my breathing began to struggle and I was having a hard time breathing. So my physician said, get to the emergency room as quickly as possible. And by the time I got there, I was literally on my last breaths. I, could, I couldn't even speak uh, to the receptionist. And so they, they, they got me a room quickly, uh, was evaluated and, and admitted. Um, and they initially put me on regular flow oxygen. But as I stayed there for another week or so, my breathing became even worse. And so they transferred me to the ICU, ICU unit, intensive care, where they put me on a what they call a high flow ventilator. Um, now, I want, I want to draw you a picture of that. A high flow ventilator is like a um, jet fighter's mask that goes over your face, covers most of your face. Um, and it's very, very tight. Uh, and then your initial reaction when you get that high flow ventilator on your face is to pull it off because uh, you become very claustrophobic. Uh, but I also knew that it was helping me breathe. So after a few hours, I got, I got used to it. And uh, to let you know how, how critical uh, this point was for, my, for me in the hospital was, I was one step away from being intubated. Um, and those, for those of you that are wondering what that is, that's, you might have seen pictures of this on the news. Um, that's when they put a tube down your throat. They essentially put you to sleep, put a tube down your throat, and it's that tube that is breathing for you. Um, fortunately, my body fought back where I didn't have to take that next step. Um, and I was also fortunate that when I got the virus in November, um, you know, seven to eight months after the pandemic started, physicians and nurses and medical uh, folks had already figured out more or less how to treat COVID. They knew uh, what techniques work, but what didn't. I was given one of those uh, kind of exotic cocktails with those new uh, medicines uh, for about a week. And in the end, after spending 23 days in the hospital, I began to recover. And so it was a, it was a close call. I didn't know which way I was gonna go when I was in there, uh, but it's uh, just amazing to me how the body fights to survive. And my body fought back, uh, but I wasn't out of the woods. You know, it's, I was taken out of ICU. I spent another 10 days just in a regular, regular room. Um, but here's the point I also wanna make about this, is that in the uh, nearly the one month that I was in the hospital, I had African-Americans treat me, I had Asian-Americans treat me, I had uh, you know, whites treat me, but not one Latinx person. Treat, didn't treat me for anything, nothing, right? And I, of course, I, I recognize that right away because 
some of the things that uh, Laura was mentioning earlier about equity in healthcare. Well, this is why we need more BIPOC people in the healthcare field, right? Imagine if I had been a first generation immigrant, didn't speak any English, uh, only spoke Spanish. Right? Imagine that my tradition was not Western medicine, but traditional indigenous medicine. And then it would have been very, very important for me to have a, a Latinx individual or someone who was conscious of my background, my ethnicity, and my position in regards to being treated with COVID-19. And so, so that's, uh, that's one of the experiences that I, that I saw. That doesn't mean that I did not get good healthcare. I got, I got what I consider probably the best healthcare that someone can receive under the conditions that I, that I was in. And in fact, I still remember some of the, the great uh, practitioners, healthcare providers uh, in, in that hospital that I'll never forget. But I think it's also important for us to be sure that we try to increase the number of BIPOC people in the healthcare fields. And I'll give you an example of this. Here in the state of Washington, Latinos make up 13% of the total population of our state, but we represent 32% of all COVID cases here in Washington. We represent all, we represent 25% of all hospitalizations and 12% of all the deaths. So that's way out of sync in regards to uh, our percentage of the population in Washington. All right? So there's a lot of things that are happening that cause that. One of them is inequities. One of them is our poverty. One of them is where we work in these so-called essential uh, jobs that puts a lot of Latinx people uh, in danger in regards to co contracting the COVID-19 um, virus. Uh, and here I am, right, a professional in a healthcare field, and I caught it, right? And I was very privileged, right? I had two privileges that I wanna mention uh, to you folks. One is that um, I'm a US citizen. I'm not undocumented, so I didn't have a fear of going to the hospital, of possibly being uh, deported, right? I also had the privilege of having great health care insurance, where most of our community does not, right? So we gotta, we gotta be aware of our privileges, right, that we have, right? We speak a lot about white privilege, which def definitely exists, and I see it every day uh, in my life experience, but we as people of color also have privileges based on our economic background based on our citizenship. And we need to be very conscious about that uh, as well. And so my COVID-19 experience was, was that, a, a heck of an experience, something I don't wish on anybody because uh, it was uh, very, very difficult. Uh, you know, when you cannot breathe and that's it, I mean, you're gone if you cannot breathe. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have help with my breathing. And um, uh, I would definitely want to allow, um, Definitely want the students who are listening today to pay attention to, to the story that Laura and I told, not only about my COVID story, but also about the inequities in healthcare and how we can fix it. Right? If we stay vigilant in regards to practicing anti-racism, making sure there's racial equity at all levels. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jerry. And thank you. You're setting me up great to talking about owning your own privilege, right? To talk about what anti-racism and trauma-informed care um, work is. So anti-racism work is about understanding the roles that we each play and experience in perpetuating racism, both individually and systemically, and working to break those down and dismantle them. And when we take something away or break something down, we have to replace it with something else generally, right? And what we replace racism with, in my mind, is trauma-informed care. And trauma-informed care is operating from a lens that recognizes the extremely complex trauma that each individual experiences due to intersecting identities and systemic oppression. And I know I'm running short on time, but I'm gonna tell you a real quick story um, to illustrate this, this intersecting identity idea, okay? So this is back in May of 2019. Um, it was summer, it was hot. Um, I had just gone on a run late at night after I put my foster kids to bed and taking a shower, it was like 9.30, almost 10 o'clock at night. Um, and um, I get out of the shower, I'm wrapped in my towel, and I hear from the side door, come out with your hands up, right? And I freeze and I think, oh no, there's something shady going on at the park across the street, right? Because there's always something shady going on at the park across the street. Um, so I freeze and I listen, I don't hear anything. And I start to move again and I hear, come out with your hands up. 
Um, and so I start to narrate my movements and I, I yell out the side door, I'm coming outside, I'm in my towel, I'm gonna try to put my hands up. And I walk outside with my hands like this. Um, and there are three um, white police officers, two men and one, one woman um, standing there holding assault rifles pointed at me, right? And they start asking me questions, interrogating me. And I keep telling them they have the wrong home, they have the wrong home. Um, and finally, they, they understand, right? And the, one of the younger gentlemen officers um, looked terrified of me, which was just ridiculous to me standing there in my towel. And I know you can't see how tall I am, but I'm four foot 11. So I'm not terribly scary, I don't think. Um, but he was terrified of me because of his experiences as a police officer, right? That he'd been in so many dangerous situations. Um, and so I'm gonna ask you to imagine layering on top of that story, some different perspectives. I want you to imagine that same situation English is my second language, or I don't speak English at all, right? Imagine that I have a mental illness and I have delusions that the FBI is tracking me and they want to hurt me, right? Imagine if I was a black man and had experienced years of macro and microaggressions and systemic oppression. And you might be able to see how quickly what I experienced could have gotten so much more dangerous, chaotic, or even lethal, given any one of those added layers. So now imagine instead of walking out of my front door to officers holding rifles point at me, I was met by an officer and a mental health counselor. Imagine having a peer of mine present as well. Imagine having a crisis therapist responding to situations or mental health crises when normally calling the police would have been the only options. There are many ways that Seymour advocates for health equity and fights for change, systemic change. Um, but one of these ways is our adult, adult mobile crisis team. Um, and our team recognizes that implicit bias exists. It recognizes that there's stigma, misunderstanding of and a history of criminalizing mental illness and psychosis. So having staff trained in issues of inequity, um, responding to situations like that decreases the use of force, decreases arrests and promotes recovery, mental health and connection. Um, in addition to specific programs like our mobile crisis team, CMR also looks to change the structure of our agency um, to strive for an agency that is self-reflective, self-aware, and trauma-informed. About two and a half years ago, Dr. Garcia and I started the Diversity, Equity, and Anti-Racism Committee. Um, we're made up of folks from all different levels of our agency and different departments, and we work to guide equity and inclusion between coworkers, for our patients, and for our agency as a whole. And we recently started implementing courageous conversations for our staff where they come together in groups to discuss issues like systemic oppression, racism, privilege, um, and trauma-informed care. So when you go into healthcare, you will impact the lives of many individuals. And I want you to set your sights high. I want you to understand the power you have not only to impact the lives of individuals, but to make large scale systemic change. You have the power to change the worlds we live in. And this is work that you can do. It's work that needs more people just like you. Um, on behalf of Dr. Garcia and myself, thank you so much for listening today. Wow. Um, I almost forgot all my questions I was going to ask you because I, I thought you, you touched on so many important points and I'm encouraging everybody in the next five minutes to please get your questions in for these two great speakers. And, and one is, is it's just the idea that a lot of people who don't have that lived experience like you did can sit back in the suburbs somewhere and think, well, you know, all they've got to do, I've heard this so much in the last year. Well, if people, if, if the minorities wouldn't resist, they wouldn't get shot, you know, and they have no idea about all the different aspects of what you're dealing with, including language, culture, ethnic, racial uh, barriers that can be, you know, issues. And I'm, I'm glad that you highlighted that. What I, I did want to ask you one question before we get into the other questions is, I think it's obvious that we need more people of color, BIPOC people in the healthcare industry. At what point can we start in our communities working to, to kind of get that message to, down to children, you know, in, in elementary school, at the YMCA, at the churches? Are there things that that uh, parents can do to encourage their kids to go into certain fields and stress that importance of, like you said, playing a role as a person of color and changing 
some of these you know discriminatory situations any suggestions that what we can all do yeah i'll just speak briefly to that and there's a lot of questions in my short on time um but i think helping children understand um the narrative around race and what that means um here you know in in washington um can start at a really young age and i know it is included in a lot of k-12 curriculum as well even courageous conversations what we're using here um at CMAR, um was born out of k-12 um, curriculum um and so allowing them to know what it means what the color of their skin means um, to themselves and to folks that might be interacting with them can help them own that and and use that in whatever profession they go into right but the folks on on this call i know helping others is what they want to do right um, and so using um kind of empowering them to use that narrative to change things um another question i had is um does it ever get overwhelming on, a, I guess, on a physical, emotional, mental level, knowing a lot about people's backgrounds and then having to help them? I mean, I mean what is, what, how, how do you practice self-care when yeah, you're helping people? That's a great question. And it's a question that comes up a lot for mental health therapists in particular. Dr. Prez said he gets like 15 minutes at a time with people, but I often spend an hour at a time or even two sometimes with folks. And maybe I've, I've had up to you know 70 people on my caseload right where i'm caring for all of those people um and um being able to separate my stuff from someone else's stuff is really important so having my own therapist um is something that i practice and then having coworkers where we can lean on each other um and help each other out is really important and then self-care um, Dr. Prez mentioned sleeping, um, eating balanced, um, taking care of yourself, but also the work that Dr. Garcia and I do helps with my burnout because it helps me to see um, how I can make larger change and helps me to decrease that feeling of powerless that powerlessness that I might have sometimes with working on the individual level. Mm -hmm. And this is for both of you. Uh, a few more questions is what can you do to encourage people or how do you encourage people that are dealing with mental health issues to uh seek care a lot of people want to shy away from that or just uh, you know some people are just in denial sometimes yeah i'll address that i mean one of the things there are still a lot of uh various cultures latinx being one of them that uh still sees mental health as a kind of a taboo uh, topic to to discuss and so the one thing that we do here at cmar is educate the population in regards to the importance uh, of seeking out uh, mental uh, behavioral health care. Uh, it's crucial, especially if people are suffering uh, from that, that we break down those kind of barriers and show folks that uh, it's uh, acceptable to receive behavioral health care, especially when it is culturally delivered in an appropriate manner. And that's, that's kind of the key. And that's why we need more people from the BIPOC community, from these various uh, backgrounds and cultures who understand that you know, providing a certain type of health care needs to come along with the culture uh, that, that you're trying to serve. And uh, I think CMAR has done a fantastic job in breaking down a lot of those barriers uh, in regards to not just behavioral health, but just uh, me medical um, uh, care in general. Um, so uh, I think those, those are some of the practices that can be, that can be done uh, to break down a lot of the barriers towards seeking out help. And speaking of barriers, if say you're a young person, and I have one person who says they're Native American and Korean, and they're seen as the other quite often, um, and it's you know that's unsettling and that's upsetting. What advice do you give to people of color entering the field in terms of dealing with the racism and the systemic structural racism that's out there? How do they get past that or deal with it? Yeah, I don't know if you get past it. Um, I grew up in Hawaii where I look like most people. And then I, I moved here for school and I don't look like most people. <laughs> um, I realized very quickly. Um, and so that was really jarring, right? And so I, I think Skyla, you had mentioned that in your comment, right? Um, that's who we're speaking to that question. Um, and having support, having people that understand what you're going through, even if they're, you know, we have got Zoom now, great things like that, right? So even if they're not right there next to you, um, having those folks is really important. And then taking breaks from equity work when you need to, um, and knowing when you've reached a limit so that you can take care of yourself and allow other folks to move that work forward um, when you're in a space to need to recover, 
um, I think is really important. So. Okay. Well, I'd love to uh, carry on a little bit more with this conversation, but in the interest of time, I wanted to uh, move on to our final speaker, it looks like. I want to thank Dr. Garcia and Laura. Uh, last but not least, I, would, I am excited to introduce Dr. Elijah Burbank. Dr. Burbank was born in Tacoma, Washington, and has a medical degree from the University of Washington School of Medicine and completed his residency in anesthesiology, critical care, and pain medicine at the University of Washington. Today, he is a general practitioner of anesthesiology and pain medicine. His academic interests include improving patient outcome metrics through optimization and standardization of preoperative patient care. He is also dedicated to maintaining the high standards of safety, comfort, and dignity for his patients in every aspect of care. When he is not in the hospital, Dr. Burbank enjoys reading, skiing, hiking, lifting weights. I'm getting tired just reading this. And spending time with his family. Dr. Burbank, we are honored to have you here and have you share your background and personal journey in medicine. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the introduction, uh, especially since I sent it to you guys to try to make myself look better. So I appreciate that. And. Uh, it's good to see all of you students. All of you guys look pretty good. Just to let you know, give yourself a pat on the back for being here. Uh, even if your dad made you do it, you're in the right place <laughs> and you're making a good decision uh, in investing in yourself. I think that um, the way that I'm gonna use this time with you guys, especially since it's limited, uh, is I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm gonna do that in the form of a story. And then I'm gonna little, tell you a little bit, I think more about America and the place that we live and who we are as humans uh, necessarily then uh, go, go deep into what it is to become an anesthesiologist. And obviously I'm gonna be here to answer any questions you guys have and I'll be available afterwards if you have anything specific to my field of medicine. So um, before I get started, I did wanna say that I heard uh, a lot of good information uh, given here, especially with regards to uh, how people should see and interact with one another and um, race, racism and race issues have been really big in the news and they're hot topic issues now. Um, according to the news media, these are a lot of issues that have been hot topic issues for years for the rest of us. And I would encourage all of you guys to start by recognizing that I'm just like you and you're just like me, 100%. We are human. It doesn't matter if we have a second X or a Y chromosome, we're human. We're all encoded to be human beings, which also means that I, like you and everybody else in this meeting, am racist. I am prejudiced, just like you're prejudiced, just like you're racist. That's a place to start from. To be prejudiced and racist is to be human. Now to fail to recognize that is to be in error. So, we are designed as human beings to see ourselves as a group and then the other. To say to yourself that somebody else for holding beliefs that they were given to them is wrong um, is to create a, a fallacy. So the fact of the matter is you're just like them. If you were given those same sets of beliefs in that same situation, you probably would react in the same, the same way because the way that they are acting is essentially human, just like you. They're prejudiced and they're racist, just like you. Just because somebody's a couple of shades lighter or darker than me doesn't mean that they have the right to decide what I'm going to do before I do it. And it's the same thing with you. So recognize we all do it. That's not what I was here to talk about. So I'm gonna move on to these stories uh, that I promise. And um, we'll go ahead and um, do that. So I'll start by saying I am from Tacoma, Washington. I was born there, I was raised there. I came back here uh, to continue to work because like almost all of you, I have a desire in myself to help, especially the people that I see around me, the people that I grew up with and the people that I know need help. This is the other thing I'm gonna say before I get into the rest of my spiel, which is while that desire to help is enviable, it's admirable and it's a lovely thing, always remember that you, in order to help others, must, must invest in yourself. The more that you invest in yourself, the more that you have the ability to help those that need it who are around you, okay? So I'll start with the story for you guys. Bang! 
before I even realize what the sound is, I'm bouncing to the floor. I hear someone scream, drive by, through the sound of shattering glass, and I hear the repeated bang, bang, bang. It's followed by the screeching of tires as the shooters peel away. I'm eight years old at this time, and this is the third drive-by shooting in my house this year. I look around the room and see all nine of the other people who live in our three-bedroom house huddled together on the floor. you think I'd be scared, right? How many of you would be scared? It makes sense. But to be honest, this had become so common to me at this time that by then it no longer seemed like a threat. No one had ever been hurt in any of these drive-by shootings and the game that the older kids had created called Drive-By that helped us train and get down onto the floor quickly to help to remove a lot of the fear that I felt. Then I heard someone yell that my six-year-old brother was bleeding. I looked over to see him crying with blood coming from between his fingers as he held his face. All that removed fear, yeah, came rushing right back. Tears streaming down my face as I watched my mom pull his hands away and thank God it was just a piece of glass that had cut his face. But after that, drive-bys always held a little bit more fear for me. This story is just an example of the type of things that scholars such as yourselves have had to brave in order to get here today. And by no means is this probably the most harrowing story that could be told. Today, I am blessed to be able to quickly share a bit about my story and hope that it serves to remind you guys that this is all a journey. I was born and raised in Tacoma, Washington, and my mom, God bless her for dealing with me, had five sons by three different men, and we were number, and I was number four. I have an identical twin brother who was number three. Our father was apparently a good man. I say apparently because I only have stories to go by. He died of a drug overdose when we were two years old, and while I don't blame him, I can't say that I've ever been able to truly forgive him for leaving my mom alone either. Mom did her best. She worked her heart out to support us. But with an 11th grade education and many hungry mouths, her options were not that many. And so she did what she could, working as an exotic dancer or a stripper for most of my young life. We didn't have much, but love was never lacking in my home. What was locked and lacking was food, clothing, and sometimes electricity or running water. Despite all that, my mom had the most generous heart and couldn't stand to see her kids or other kids in the family go without. And there were many other kids in the family. She couldn't stand to see them suffer for their parents' bad decisions. So our home became the oasis, the safe place for kids to go when their parents were selling drugs or using drugs or any combination of the two. This led to a lively household. And to be honest, lively is probably an understatement. There wasn't a day where my mom came home often after working 10 or 12 hours that she didn't find new holes in the walls, new broken windows or a gaggle of little heathens running around and jumping off the roof onto mattresses laid out in the grass. Life was a bit chaotic, but all oh, it was fun. Now don't let this rosy picture fool you. Though we always had each other, often that's about all we had. I still remember the clearest day being nine years old and laying awake at night in a single bed that I shared with two of my brothers hearing my younger brother crying because he was hungry and couldn't go to sleep. I remember the anger, even at that age and understanding the unfairness of, the, of this coloring of my sense of justice. I remember the fervently whispered vows between me and my brothers. That night we made a pact, my brother and I, we had three promises we made to each other at nine years old. First, our children would be proud of us. They would never find themselves in a classroom as we did, lying about what their parents did or where they were. Second, our children would never go hungry no matter what it took. And third, that we would help people. We had seen so much pain and so much violence by this time that we vowed that we would be the solution, not the problem. How we would achieve these things, that was a little bit more of a mystery. As you've heard before, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And all we had seen at this point was a whole lot of love surrounded by a whole lot of poor. Our answer came to us one day when one of our older brothers came home and he told us about this fantastic job called a neurosurgeon. Oof. This was the job that was respected, 
You got to help people every day and neurosurgeons were rich. Meaning we and our children would never go hungry again. By the time my brother finished telling his story, my twin brother and I, Ruben, we had decided that was it. We're, we were neurosurgeons. That was all. By the fifth grade, we'd attended six different elementary schools and had our house burned down to the ground once and had seen our first person shot in the streets. This was the year that my mother decided that she didn't want to continue working as a stripper and went back to school, which sounds good. It was good. She was investing in herself. It sounds great until you realize that this made the sometimes missed meal into a, if you don't eat at school, you might not eat today situation. Mom left the semi-lucrative world of exotic dancing for the dirt poor world of community college with all of us surviving on just her financial aid. And you know what? We couldn't have been more proud of her. But I still remember the change. I remember the food bank food was often now the only food I had if there was any. And I still also remember one time spending two weeks with nothing but potatoes uh, to eat, which really wasn't that bad until the ketchup ran out and the butter ran out. Then things got ugly. Despite all these struggles, we never forgot who we were, where we came from, and what we had promised each other. And now you may have guessed it. While I was a rumbunctious child, I was loud and outgoing. I was able to become a doctor. I have an identical twin brother who looks just like me, slightly less handsome, uh, just on the other side of the mountains, who's a trauma surgeon. We never let each other forget. You young people, you guys are coming from right the same place that I come from, right? You've probably heard all the words, you know, the looks that people give you that say, bless your heart, but do you know where you're from? Or the one that says, you're so well-spoken for someone from your background, but maybe you should aim a little lower. That's okay. You got to be more than ready to prove them wrong. Throughout school, both my brother and I excelled academically, using our pack and a healthy dose of competition to push each other. If I got an A in a class, he needed an A plus. If he got varsity on the wrestling team, you better believe I was gonna make team, team captain. And if you ever did less than excellent, you would never stop hearing about it. I still to this day make fun of Ruben for getting a C in handwriting when he was a kid. And I'll never let him forget it. This competition helped to push us. By the time we were in high school, we both had 3.8 GPAs. We were playing several varsity sports and sports and we were in multiple clubs. We were taking courses at a community college. Now, don't think that this means we weren't still struggling at home. By high school, we were both very into weightlifting and fighting sports and that extra testosterone helped boys our age get into a little bit of trouble here and there. We sometimes hung out with the wrong crowd. We sometimes, um, we're told that our family was the wrong crowd. We still often went hungry, but we took, even if we had to take the children to the parks to get the free lunches that were served in the summer, we would never let them go without. By 11th grade, we were, we were the students that were kind of poised to go either way. Um, we were, it was kind of close for a while. We knew we had talent, but as we were nearing the end of school, we were really considering dropping out. I know me in particular. I didn't think that I could afford college. It seemed kind of like a pie in the sky type of dream. Uh, that's until I heard about this thing called a scholarship. I had never heard of a scholarship. All I knew was I can't pay for school. And fortunately, the difference in my life was a high school counselor who helped me to apply for everything that didn't say you had to be a woman. They saw the potential in me, which was pretty crazy, right, at that time. But once I heard about the fact people were actually willing to help you pay to go to school to improve your life, I couldn't stop myself from filling out every application. Between grants and scholarships, both my brother and I earned full rides to UW for undergraduate and then medical school. It's possible. While in both places, we work to leave a legacy of service, learning and growth, and then always planned on coming back to give to those that are given to us, to those who couldn't do that thing for themselves. I had my first child at age 20. 
a uh, couple of years after that, I decided that I think uh, neurosurgery wasn't the way that I wanted to go. I was more of an anesthesiologist, but that was a crisis moment. That was a moment I had to decide to invest in myself. I joined the Navy when I was in my first year of medical school, choosing to continue that spirit of service. After spending five years in San Diego as a Naval Medical Officer, I came back here to the UW, applied back to and completed my residency in anesthesia and decided uh, that uh, I wanted to stay here and work in Tacoma where I come from. I wanted to give back to the community that had birthed me. So anyways, that's a quick clean version of one story I can tell you. Uh, and trust me when I could, I could tell you some stories that sound like they come straight out of a, a gangster movie. Uh, but I don't tell this story to make me seem different. I tell this story to let you see that I am a scholar. It doesn't matter where I came from or what people thought I should do or could do. I decided that I am a scholar. Invest in yourself. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the nation we're in. I'll try not to go too long with your time. And for some of you guys, these statistics might seem a little uh, old because they're six years old, but statistics, unfortunately, aren't produced as readily as we would like them. But in 2015, the US incarceration rate was 670 people per 100,000, which is the highest in the world. One in every 115 adults in America was in prison or jail in 2015, and there were 2.2 million incarcerated, a 500% increase over the last 40 years of our incarceration rates. Now, you might be asking yourself why I'd come here uh, talking to you scholars about prison statistics, but there is a very real correlation between income, education, and incarceration. Did you know that the average level of education for incarcerated individuals is less than 10th grade? You just heard me tell you, so you have a good idea of what my formative lives were like, or formative years were like. Without individuals that are willing to reach out to and give a hand up to, individual, to everybody else and provide help and mentorship to people like me, I very likely would be one of these statistics instead of sitting here and quoting them to you. Too often the difference between, between being a contributing member of society and another person who fell through the cracks is someone who cares enough to try. I was fortunate when I was in the 11th grade and just beginning to think about college and honestly didn't think I can go. I had the good grades and I knew I couldn't afford it. I heard the word scholarship and I had counselors and a mentor who were willing to reach out and talk to me when things seemed impossible, when it didn't seem like a real dream, someone to give me a hand up just when I needed it. You should be the person both giving and receiving the hand. I was blessed with that high school mentor, with the counselor that encouraged me to apply for those scholarships and just see what happens. One individual willing to reach out to me helped to make a world of difference by caring. Now, one in 17 black men aged 30 to 34 was in prison in 2015, as were one in 42 Hispanic males and one in 91 white men in the same age group. I've had many mentors, many helping hands, and many people willing to provide the rungs on the ladder to help me get to where I am today. And without any one of these people, instead of Elijah Burbank, MD, sitting here and speaking to you, I could very well be just Elijah, the ex-con and looking for a handout. The medium incarcerated man had a pre-incarceration income that was about $19,500. That's less than half that of the median non-incarcerated man's median income. Now the median incarcerated woman had a pre-incarceration income that was about $14,000. Still about half the median non-incarcerated woman's income. So what's a bachelor's degree worth? On average, individuals earning bachelor's degrees make $19,400 more than those with, that are just high school grads. That's just under that $19,500 mark that I just told you about. 
So we see that that degree already takes an individual from the median income range of the incarcerated individual and moves them to the median income range of the non-incarcerated individual. That one degree, regardless of race or sex. Add to that the fact that in 2010, the cost of corrections expenditures in the U.S. was greater than $80 billion annually, and that each U.S. resident contributes $260 every year to fund those corrections expenditures. And you start to see the scope of the problem. Our time, energy, and resources are much better spent in fostering education, mentoring our students, and providing resources for all those in need than in paying to help marginalize those who fall through the cracks. And when you consider that within three years of release, about two-thirds, 67.8%, actually, of released prisoners are rearrested, re and then within five years of release, about three quarters, 76.6% of released prisoners are rearrested, and that children of incarcerated individuals are three times as likely to become involved with the legal system, you start to see that inaction now is perpetuating a drain on our society, a drain on our youth, and frankly, a drain on the pocketbook. I sat in the same seats as you talented young scholars Years ago, I've been blessed to have someone that, was, that cared just like you've been blessed to have someone that cared, even if it's your dad making you come to this session. Because of parent caring people, just like those that are helping to put on this program, I was able to go to medical school, earn a degree, become a US Naval physician and serve my country. I've had the opportunity to heal and serve our armed forces, and now I have the opportunity to come back and serve you guys. There's nothing greater you can do. All the, almost everyone I saw said they have a spirit of service. You want to give. Invest now in yourself so that what you can give to those that you care about is the greatest of yourself. That's all I have for you tonight. Happy to answer some questions. I have no idea if I went over time. Well, you went uh, a little bit over, but uh, as somebody pointed out in the chat or in, messaged me and said, you're so great that we're cutting you some slack. I'm so, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, we have a few questions. We have a few minutes, so I'm going right. to try and get to as many questions. One is just talk about being an anesthesiologist. Somebody said, is it boring or is it fun? What, what do you get out of doing that kind of work? All right. Uh, I'll tell you right now, being an anesthesiologist is fantastic. Most people don't really know about the profession. Um, so me personally, I like to work with my hands. If I didn't become an anesthesiologist, maybe I would have been a mechanic or something like that. I like to do procedures. And that's something that in anesthesiology you get to do every day. So the tube uh, that Dr. Garcia was talking about that, that he, thank God, didn't have to receive in order to help him. Anesthesiologists are, are the usual airway experts that place those tubes for people who are um, have emergency situations. But one of the biggest things that we do is essentially facilitate surgery. So somebody comes in, and if you think about it, surgery minus anesthesia is essentially murder. There's no way to survive the opening of your abdominal or thoracic cavity and the removal of organs and that sort of thing. It's not survivable. Surgery used to be whack you on the head, tie off your leg and cut it off before you wake up. That's pre-anesthesia surgery and that's as much as we're essentially able to do. But because when people come in, I can put in IVs that allow me to give them medicines and fluids that keep them alive or blood and blood products if necessary if we have too much blood loss because I have monitors on that monitor their heart and the electrophysiology of their heart that monitor their fluid status, that monitor how well I'm breathing for them. We're able to put them into such a deep level of sleep. It's no longer really considered sleep. It's now considered an anesthetic and we can do these surgeries, these things that would not be possible to do to a living person, we can do them and perform amazing miracles of medicine. Personally, I think that if you're thinking about becoming a anything, you should think about becoming an anesthesiologist. I love my job. Probably the best thing that I could ever imagine doing. Someone wanted to know tips on getting a full ride scholarship to med school. Is that possible? It is possible. So uh, step number one is you cannot get the pay if you do not do the play. Apply. 
If you don't have an application in, your chances of getting any scholarship is zero. So put your put in, make sure your dog's in the fight, your horse is in the race, whatever you want to call it. You can't win if you don't play. Um, at the UW, at the year that I was applying, they were they just happened to to uh, have a couple of scholarships. I learned about them and I always applied for every scholarship, which is something that if you're if you're not doing, talk to your counselor or talk to somebody in this program about speaking to a counselor because um, you should be applying for. It doesn't matter if your parents make a thousand dollars a year or you know a million billion dollars. You should be applying for these scholarships. Many of them are income based. Many of them are more merit based. So give yourself the chance, the best shot at the best life you can give yourself. Okay, last question is any other um, suggestions for like networking or seizing those opportunities that could lead somewhere? And what I mean by that is you mentioned and all of our speakers have mentioned about mentoring that uh, there was a mentor that was that person who believed in you or gave you a chance. Now that's great, but I think also you need to go and make things happen. Yeah. So, so what are some suggestions for, especially, you know, Teenagers can get out and network just like us. We yeah. adults, right? Make yeah. connections. So my biggest suggestion would be try to be where what you want is, right? So if you want a mentor, someone who's interested in the community and giving back to the community, someone who's going to reach out to you and to help you, one, you're already in a good place now. But two, in the future, try to continue to put yourself in those positions. If you want to find a mentor, somebody who's giving of themselves, Go volunteer. There's more likely to be people who are of the giving and volunteering um, spirit in those places. Go volunteer to high school, or sorry, you're in high school, so go volunteer to middle school. That's when I first started was in high school. I went back and spoke to some of you guys know of Jason Lee and in Tacoma. Went back and I would try to speak to the kids and be a wrestling coach, not for anything other than to say, hey, because a lot of people in in my community weren't making it. To high, to high school, They're, they make it partway through high school. So just say, hey guys, look, I'm a, I'm a guy who looks like you. I lift weights. I'm not a super goofy guy. You can be, you know, you can play sports and be cool and be smart and try. So, but if you go to those places where you're giving of yourself, you're gonna find people who are doing the exact same thing. And that's a great way to start networking. Yeah, surrounding yourself with people who are supportive and have, who have connections. And the other thing I was going to suggest is just sometimes hospitals or, you know, care center, care Go facilities volunteers. are looking for volunteers. And you start hey, look, putting yourself in that environment and learning. Well, we want to thank you very much for such a great inspirational presentation. And I'm hoping that all of us can see you again at some point and benefit from your knowledge and, you know, just the the great motivational things that you said today. So um, if everybody can just clap in front of their computers for all our presenters, including uh, Dr. Elijah uh, Burbank. There they are, all our speakers, give a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'm gonna kind of, as they told me to take it home, so to speak. So I just wanted to thank everyone for coming uh, today. This is the beginning of a, a great week where you're going to find out a lot of important information. You're going to gather insight. You're gonna be able to talk to people and ask people questions about, you know, this is better than Google, right? Or, or a documentary. You're actually talking to people who have the boots on the ground, so to speak. There were several themes that kept coming up today about mentoring, taking advantage of, um, of um, opportunities, networking. Um, and this last presentation was just talking about how someone was not in the best of circumstances and still had uh, that fortitude. Uh, I love the story about you and your brother being in competition with each other. You know, any anytime you can find someone who supports you or who could take that journey with you, whether it be your brother, a sibling, a friend, you don't want to be people around, you don't want to be around people who discount you or try and say, oh, you're, you're never going to make it. You, you know, forget about it. You're just a dreamer, you know, because some of the most successful people will tell you that at some point they have people like that in their lives. Finally, you mentioned uh, Dr. Burbank talked about incarceration, which I'm glad you did, because sometimes it could be just that one bad decision that takes, especially BIPOC 
communities, takes you down that bad road, you know, going to the wrong party, getting in the wrong car kind of thing. Just be aware of that. Keep focused on what your goals and dreams are. And then one day you'll achieve them. 